Um, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you guys for taking the time to, to join this webinar um, to learn about this virus and, and help us protect the rabbits that are in Indiana. My name is Dr. Melissa Justice. I'm a field veterinarian with the Indiana State Board of Animal Health. And in addition to my field duties, I'm also the director of small animal health programs. My goal for this presentation is to provide some current information about rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, hopefully to answer or address some of the questions that we've been getting at our office, and then finally shift the focus of the presentation to biosecurity and disease prevention. Throughout the program, if you have questions, we'd be happy to answer them along the way. If you'll just type those into our chat box, um, our public information office is monitoring the chat box and they'll get those questions to me along the way. Um, we'll hopefully have some time at the end that we can also answer questions um, if, if they arise during the presentation. Um, so again, I just wanna thank everybody for sticking with us and, and taking time out of your busy days to join us. Um, Hopefully we can get some useful information to you and answer some of your questions. So I'll start by giving just some information about the, um, about the disease. This is a highly contagious infectious viral disease that affects only rabbits. Um, as we've seen, there are uh, a couple of strains, so it affects both wild rabbits in the United States as well as domestic species. The good news is, is that it's not a zoonotic infection, so it does not affect human health, and it also doesn't affect other species. Um, and this is kind of an important factor for us to talk about and for us to think about. While other species can't be infected and end up showing clinical signs of illness, they are very capable of acting or serving as a mechanical vector. So they are able to transport this virus in a viable infectious form from one, one location to the other. Um, and I think that this is part of the problem um, with the ongoing outbreak is that there are so many species that are capable of moving this virus around in an infectious state. Um, I don't think we can afford to forget about the other species, even though they can't be infected by the virus. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the presentation. This virus is caused by, or this infection is caused by a Khaleesi virus, which is a non-enveloped single strand RNA virus, and it has a high morbidity and mortality rate. And what I mean by that is if a rabbit is exposed to the virus, there is a high chance that it will become infected and it will show clinical signs of illness. Also with that infection, there's a high potential for that animal to die as a result of this infection. And that's what I mean by a high morbidity and a high mortality rate. There are a lot of strains of this virus um, that, are, that are known worldwide, but we really focus in on two or three of those, those strains, RHDV1 um, and RHDV2. RHDV1 is a form of the virus or a strain of the virus that we experienced here in Indiana back in 2005. Um, and RHDV2 is the form of the virus that we are experiencing as an outbreak down in the South United States right now. I put together just a basic uh, comparison of RHDV1 and RHDV2. And the, the viruses or the strains are very, very similar in their clinical characteristics with just a few subtle differences. The incubation period for our current strain, our RHDV2, um, has a, is much longer. Um, so from the point that an animal is exposed to the virus until they begin to cl show clinical signs, we expect that time frame to be about three to nine days. Where with RHDV1, it's a much shorter incubation period, usually about 16 hours to three days before those animals will begin showing clinical signs. RHDV2 is capable of affecting animals at a much younger age. Um, so we can see clinical signs in these animals or in these rats as young as two weeks of age. Where with RHDV1, it tends to affect older rabbits um, or those that are eight to nine weeks old of age or older. The mortality rate, um, is listed in the literature as being lower for RHDV2, um, anywhere between five and seventy, or yeah, five and seventy percent, with an average of twenty percent. The epidemiologic investigation hasn't been completed for the the um, ongoing outbreak in the southwestern U.S., but I have to believe that we're going to see that the the mortality rate is going to be higher than twenty percent, or at the upper end of that. Again, that's just speculation on my part. 
But what we're hearing from a lot of those states is that they're experiencing high levels of mortality in, in their rabbitries and in their colonies. RHDV1 has a known higher mortality rate, usually about 80 to 90 percent. Um, and the last point I, I think is, is one of the biggest differences that I see. RHDV2 or a current infection that's going on in the United States is capable of infecting not only rabbits of European descent, which are our domestic rabbits here in the United States, but we also have seen susceptibility in the wild rabbits. So hares, jackrabbits, and cottontails are, are getting infected and dying in the southwestern United States. Um, and we have every reason to believe that the eastern cottontail and the swamp rabbit here in Indiana would be susceptible to this disease as well. In 2005, when we diagnosed RHDV1 here in Indiana, the um, European rabbits or the domestic rabbits were the only species that was susceptible. So it was a much different um, virus that we were facing back in 2005 than what we're facing now. I want to talk briefly about the clinical signs that we would see. And there are several uh, different forms of RHDV2. With the paracute form, um, we typically just see acute collapse or sudden death in these animals that are affected. With the more acute stage or the more acute form of the virus, we can see a loss of appetite, lethargy, high fever, and some rabbits can even experience spasms, shaking, or seizures. As the name would imply, um, we, we do expect to see bleeding from the nose, mouth, and rectum because it's a hemorrhagic disease. And it's really, really important to remember that some rabbits are completely asymptomatic. So exposure to the virus doesn't necessarily mean that, that a rabbit is infected with the virus. Rabbits will just be ex exposed and never progress to an infected state showing clinical signs. Others will be exposed and become infected, and then they'll either um, be asymptomatic or they'll die as a re result of the infection or they'll recover. And the reason that this is important is because infected rabbits that are asymptomatic or they recover from the infection can shed the virus into the environment for a period of two to four months post-infection. And the reason I feel like this is important um, is that the, the literature that we've, we've seen in, what, in, in um, other cases is that natural infection will typically result in shedding of the virus for a period of about 42 to 60 days post-infection, or that's about equivalent to a two-month time frame. And that's really important when we start talking about um, quarantining animals that are coming into facility, and when we start thinking we're going to deal with affected premises and allow them to go back to normal activities. The four-month date has really just been seen in experimental infections that are induced in the laboratory. So what I really want you to focus in on is that two-month shedding period and keep that in mind as we're going through the remainder of the presentation. RHDV2, unfortunately, is an extremely hardy virus that can survive for long periods of time outside of the host. And I think this is another complicating factor um, that we're facing if we start talking about eliminating this virus from the United States. Environmental temperature, humidity, and protection by organic materials are all very important factors that allow for the virus's survival. Um, so just some, some things that I, want you, that I want you to be thinking about is that RHDV2 is capable of surviving in a dried state on cloth or on clothing at room temperature for 105 days. That's almost four months that this virus is capable of surviving um, if we don't prop properly clean and disinfect cloth and clothing that's exposed to the virus. It's capable of surviving for one hour at temperatures of 122 degrees Fahrenheit. It's capable of surviving for a period of 22 to 35 days at normal room temperature, which is 72 degrees. It's able to survive the freezing and thawing cycles, which to me is, is um, you know, a pretty big deal. A lot of times I think that, you know, we believe that if we have a carcass or if we have hunted meat or a pelt or something like that and we put it in the freezer and allow it to thoroughly freeze, when we thaw that material back out, it's, it's no longer going to re, um, remain infective. There's, the pathogen is no longer going to be there, and that's simply not the case for this virus. We have seen that um, with meat or with carcasses frozen, they will remain infective once they're thawed out. 
And the last point I want to make is that um, this virus is capable of surviving for 90 days or more in decaying tissues or carcasses that are left outdoors. Um, we know that wild rabbits can be infected with this, and we know that other animals are capable of moving this virus around. This is a real big deal um, for the survivability and transmission of this virus. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a few minutes, but um, you know, it's, it's a pretty hardy virus and, and that makes it formidable. Rabbit hemorrhagic disease will spread between, between rabbits either through ingestion or inhalation of the virus. So it's either, it's either gonna go in through the nose or the mouth in a direct transmission. Um, so with direct transmission, we're typically thinking about um, a rabbit having contact with another infected rabbit, either live or dead, having contact with secretions and excretions from another rabbit. So things like saliva, nasal discharge, urine, blood, and feces are all infected materials that can um, allow for direct transmission of the virus from one rabbit to another. And as I touched on before, if a rabbit has contact with an infected rabbit product, they're able to, to um, get the infection. So this would be things like fur, wool, and fresh or frozen meats. For indirect transmission, we're talking about the use of fomites to, to move this virus around. And so this is when a rabbit has contact with an inanimate object, or the, excuse me, has contact with an inanimate object that's been contaminated by the virus. And we can move this virus around inadvertently place to place on our clothing and shoes, on dishes and water bottles, cages and carriers, contaminated feed, hay and grass and contaminated bedding. So we need to be thinking about um, these things when we're you know, purchasing new supplies or when we're borrowing equipment and things like that, that these are all possible um, mechanical ways that we can move this virus from another source into our rabbitries and into our colonies and make sure that we're cleaning and disinfecting them appropriately before bringing them in. The last thing I wanna to touch on I already mentioned this, but um, indirect transmission of the virus can occur um, or be spread by insects, scavengers, birds, and rodents. So mechanical transport can occur when um, a, a virus is moved from an infected source to another surface. Um, you know, we can, we can touch something or a dog or a coyote can touch something and they can move this around in the, the um, environment just very easily by having it on their feet or their fur. This next point is really interesting to me. If a carnivore eats a dead carcass, the virus can pass through the animal's GI tract and remain viable and infective in its feces. So if another animal comes in contact with that feces, they can mechanically move it from place to place. Or if a wild rabbit comes in contact with that feces, it can be directly infected with the virus. Humans can transport the virus by touching an infected rabbit and then touching other rabbits. So we really need to be thinking about this possibility um, when we go to fairs and exhibitions or when we're working within our rabbitry or our colony and moving from animal to animal. Remember that, that just by touching um, surfaces, we're capable of moving this hardy virus around and infecting other animals or rabbits. I wanna to touch very briefly on diagnosis and treatment. Um, as of right now, um, CD2 is considered to be a foreign animal disease in the United States. And, and what this means is, is that we either currently don't have the disease in the United States or it's not considered to be endemic in the United States. And as such, what that means is that um, if you would observe an animal that you believe is, is exhibiting clinical signs, we'd ask that you contact your veterinarian for consultation. Um, if you don't have a veterinarian, you could certainly call our office directly. Um, and we'll discuss the case with you. If we believe that the, the animal is potentially infected, then we will dispatch a foreign animal disease diagnostician either to the veterinary clinic or to your facility <clears throat> to collect samples from those animals and submit those to our foreign animal disease diagnostic laboratory that's in Plum Island, New York. Um, an FADD or a foreign animal disease diagnostician is a veterinarian that specifically and biosecurity and um, the identification of, of diseases that we don't have here in the United States. Um, and the good news here in Indiana is that we have a lot of trained foreign animal disease diagnosticians. Um, in the event that we do start to see rabbits showing clinical signs, 
um, you know, we have a lot of veterinarians who can respond and get those samples submitted for you. The bad news with this disease is that there's not currently an easy, reliable antemortem test for live animals. Um, so with a lot of other diseases, you know, we can take our rabbits into the veterinary clinic and collect a sample, whether it be a blood sample or a swab of the nasal, nasal cavity, the oral cavity, or something like that. And they can send that sample into the laboratory. And within a couple of days, they can get you a diagnosis of whether or not your animal has that disease and they can start treatment. We don't currently have that capability um, reliably for this particular disease. Um, our, RHTB2. Um, unfortunately, the only testing that we have considered to be reliable is a postmortem test. Um, so for deceased rabbits, we can collect those samples and we can send them in. There's not currently a known treatment for RHTB. There's no cure for RHTB2. Um, so the best that we can do is just simply provide symptomatic supportive care to the rabbits that are affected. So this would be things like fluid therapy, antibiotics, antidiarrheal um, treatments, things to hopefully make the rabbit feel better and get them through this. So one of the big questions we've been getting um, at our office and, and one of the things that I think probably most people who are here today are interested in is, is what is the response that the state is gonna take if we would happen to get a positive diagnosis here in Indiana? And the answer is, is that these are gonna be handled on a case by case basis. Um, if, if we get a positive diagnosis, we're going to go out and talk to the owner of those animals um, and, and have a dialogue to find out what the intended use of those animals is, what's the value of the animal, um, what's your level of biosecurity on the farm, um, and, and together we'll help make decisions about the outcome. Ultimately, there are really two options for management of an affected domestic premises, um, and those include placing a quarantine on the premises and, and having movement restrictions of both rabbits and rabbit equipment or euthanasia of the animals followed by a, a fallow period or a period where there are no susceptible species on the property um, prior to allowing for restocking. The important thing to remember with both of those options is that there's, they're both gonna involve a quarantine of the property, proper, disposable, proper disposal of all deceased animals or animal products, Strict cleaning and disinfection protocols need to be incorporated into the daily activities on the property. And then implementation of biosecurity measures, which we'll talk about more later in this presentation. The ultimate goal, um, both of the owner of the property and our agency, and I think all regulatory agencies, is we just really wanna make sure that we mitigate disease transmission to other domestic and wild and try to stop or slow the spread of this infection, if at all possible. The next question that we've got is, is it recommended or for 4-Hers to show rabbits this year? And I'm gonna answer that question here in just a second. So hang tight with me and we'll get to it. Another question. How long is the quarantine? Um, so typically the quarantine is gonna be anywhere. Um, I, I don't know that exactly because it varies in different areas of the US. Um, you know, I would say anywhere between three and six months. Um, and it's really based on whether the owner chooses euthanasia of the animals or whether they choose to, um, you know, wait it out and just be quarantined. If they do choose to be quarantined, it tends to be a little bit longer um, because we need to start our, our period to return to normal activity based on when the last animal shows clinical signs of illness. Um, and so I don't have a, I don't have a definite answer on what that quarantine period would be. It really depends on um, on on what we choose to do on that particular pro property and what the biosecurity level is on that property. So moving on to vaccination, this is this is the next big question that we keep getting in our office. Um, you know, if and when Indiana is going to have access to this vaccination. Uh, currently, there's no licensed vaccine in the United States, and I think most rabbit producers and most breeders are aware that there are two killed vaccines that are currently being produced in Europe. The first product is called Filovac, which is produced in France, effective against RHDV1 and RHDV2. The second product is produced in Spain, and it's called Aravac, and it's only effective against RHDV2. 
neither of these products are licensed for use in the United States, so they have to be approved for importation and administration by the USDA Center for Veterinary Biologics, or the CVB. As of right now, the CVB is only approving emergency use of the vaccine in affected states as a response measure and a control measure. They're not currently um, allowing the um, unaffected states to use this vaccine as a preventive measure. Um, and the reason that this is, is that the two companies that, are, able, that are, are producing the vaccine in Europe are unable to supply both the European and the United States market. Um, you know, they've been in this business for quite a while, producing vaccines for Europe and some of the other countries where this disease is endemic. And they've scaled their production to the need that's been required in those European companies. Um, they've expressed to us that they have made available to us the number of doses that they have. Um, and that they don't have the ability to increase their production to meet the, the market needs of the United States. The good news is, is that the um, USDA and Center for Veterinary Biolog Biologics is currently working with a manufacturer here in the United States in conjunction with the university to create a domestic FDA approved vaccine for RHGV2. Once the product is approved and it goes through all the process, it's going to be available for anyone and everyone here in the United States who wants to vaccinate their rabbits. Um, so hopefully the projections are that we're going to have a domestic vaccination available for distribution later this fall. Um, and we'll keep you posted on that as we learn more about that. Uh, my guess is, is that that vaccination is going to be distributed and administered by veterinarians. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, make sure that you have a relationship with a veterinarian um, and that you express an interest in having that vaccine when it becomes available so that you're at the top of their list. Um, it's a good dialogue to start having so that when it does become available, you guys can have access to it and, and get the vaccine. Okay, um, so the questions that we got, I am going to address here just a little bit in the presentation. So I'm going to hold off on those. And if we don't get those answered, just let me know, okay? So I want to talk just briefly about the current situation of the outbreak here in the United States. Um, and you can see that we've got three different areas in the US um, that are highlighted on this map. I'll start with the state of Washington. Um, since late 2018, early 2019, they have been fighting an outbreak of um, in an island off of the coast of Washington. This has kind of been a smoldering problem for them um, because it's in both their wild rabbits and their domestic rabbits. Um, and the last case that was diagnosed um, up, in, up in that area was January of this year. Um, so they're still fighting that. They're, they're using the vaccine. They're doing the, the best protocols they can to fight that infection, but it's still going on. New York is highlighted in March this year. They experienced an outbreak or a diagnosis of 11 rabbits in a single veterinary hospital. The good news with New York is, is that they have not reported any further outbreak or any further diagnoses of, of RHDB2 in that state, um, nor have they been reporting any dead rabbits that are being found in large groups or things like that. And I think that the big cause for concern for most of us is what's going on in the Southwest. Um, so starting uh, in late March of 2020, um, this disease has been diagnosed in both wild rabbits and domestic rabbits in the states of New York, Arizona, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, and California. Um, and, and most of those states are still seeing ongoing diagnoses. Um, it's also been diagnosed in the five northern states in Mexico. Um, and on the next map, I want to show you um, just briefly. I don't have a I ha don't have a link for this, um, but this is a, an updated map that is available on the USDA RHDV2 website. And this map is updated every day. Um, I made this presentation, it was on June 1st. So we've got the, the map as of June 1st, but it, it is updated every day. And what it shows you is where diagnoses are currently occurring um, in feral rabbits, wild rabbits, domestic rabbits, both in um, the Southwestern United States and in Mexico. 
um, you know, so check this out. It's a good website. It's a good map um, to keep abreast of where the infections are going. The source of the current infection in the Southwest, Southwest hasn't been identified yet. Um, the epidemiologic investigations are ongoing and um, you know they're 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 fighting the fire right now they're they're trying to take care of the new infections and conduct those epidemiologic investigations um, the information that we've received from whole genomic sequencing and phylogenetic data suggests that there was a single point of introduction into the the southwestern united states we haven't been able to get that same information from the the data that's been collected in mexico so we don't know if the cases in Mexico are genetically linked to the cases in the southwestern United States, but just know that the, um, you know, the USDA and, and um, other agencies are working to try to get that information to, to see if we can figure out how this disease got into the southwest. So I want to um, shift gears a little bit and talk about prevention and biosecurity. And this is um, hopefully gonna address a lot of the questions that we've been getting during this webinar. But again, if we don't answer your question specifically, please don't hesitate to, um, you know, to chime in and let us know. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have access to a vaccination in Indiana. And I'll be quite honest, um, you know, I don't want us to get the disease for to get the vaccination. Um, so I would rather have us start looking at ways that we can prevent the introduction of the virus and increase our biosecurity at shows and, and on our personal properties and in our residents so that we can um, try to prevent the, the spread of this infection into Indiana, if at all possible. So I wanna talk a little bit about, um, before you ever attend a show, some things that I want you to think about or consider. Um, a lot of show organizers have reached out to us and, and ask us what they should be thinking about and what they should be doing. Just remember, it's not only the responsibility of the show organizer to protect your rabbits, it's also the responsibility of each and every owner to take steps to protect their own, their own rabbits and their own animals. So when you're thinking about what shows you want to attend, consider what are the origins of the other exhibitors or the other rabbits? Is this an Indiana only show or is this a show where um, people from outside Indiana are allowed to, to attend and exhibit? Um, don't be afraid to ask the organizers. If it's not obvious to you when you're, when you're thinking about signing up or registering, don't be afraid to reach out to them and ask them. Um, think about if exhibitors or rabbits from the affected states are going to be allowed to attend. And if so, what additional measures are going to be taken um, at the show to reduce the spread of disease? It's interesting because the American Rabbit Breeders Association, or ARBA, is currently asking all breeders in the affected states to voluntarily recognize a herd quarantine of their animals until RHDV2 infections are managed in their area. So they're not prohibiting people from the affected states from coming to their shows, but they're ask, asking them to think about what their situation is and whether they'd be putting other animals at risk by attending those shows. And if they believe that there's a potential for them to spread that virus, they're asking them not to come um, and really not to take their animals to shows. And so I think that's huge. The things that I would encourage you to think about if you attend exhibitions are to avoid touching rabbits that don't belong to you or that originate from outside your own rabbitry or colony. If you do have to handle rabbits that don't belong to you, make sure that you wear gloves. And ideally, you'd be wearing disposable gloves um, that you don't have to try to clean and disinfect, that you can just throw away. And then make sure that you properly wash your hands and sanitize with a, with a hand sanitizer before you ever go back and handle your own equipment or your own rabbits. If I can stress anything, I wanna make sure that people think about this. Absolutely do not share equipment, supplies, food or water with other exhibitors. And this doesn't only apply to rabbits. This applies to all animals when you go to exhibitions or shows. Take your own equipment, take your own food. Um, and I'm even gonna go one step further and say that some people have even considered taking their own water to rabbit exhibitions this year, um, just simply because when you're getting rabbit or when you're getting water at a show and you're using a shared hose you don't know if that nozzle has touched anybody else's bowls. You don't know if um, someone else may have had uh, exposure to a, a pathogen that you aren't interested in taking back to your rabbits. 
So you might even go that extra step and just think about bringing your own water to your exhibitions and shows. Um, but just, you know, make sure that you take everything that you need when you go to the shows. Don't borrow supplies from, from other exhibitors because you don't know the health status of their, their animals and they don't know the health status of yours. Um, make sure that you ensure appropriate distancing or spacing between the cages. And I don't mean this between um, your own cages. What I mean is make sure that you have adequate spacing between your animals and those animals that are belonging to other people. Um, you know, right now we're all thinking about social, social distancing. We're all um, well aware of social distancing. Um, and don't just distance from other people when you're at these exhibitions. Make sure that your rabbits also have that same benefit. If it's not possible to place some space between um, your rabbits and those belonging to others, you might consider taking a non-permeable barrier that you can place between your rabbits and, and other animals. And in my mind, this could be something as simple as a, a trifold piece of cardboard. As long as it doesn't get wet or saturated, it's capable of, of blocking the movement of pathogens between, between animals. You could also think about a piece of clear plexiglass um, you know, I, I, I'm not advocating making a complete barrier around your cages because we certainly don't want to affect the welfare of those animals. We want to make sure that they can see adequate ventilation and airflow and things like that. But just think about putting some sort of distance between your animals and others. And honestly, I don't know, you know, what a good distance is. I think we're all thinking six feet right now because that's what's been ingrained in our head over the last couple of months. Um, there's not an exact number but just try to do the best that you can to make sure that there's space between your animals and others. I'd encourage you to disinfect common surfaces before allowing your animal to have contact. Um, and most of the show organizers reached out to us and, and asked us about appropriate disinfectants, asked us you know, what they can be doing to provide a safe show in a safe environment, and that's great. But as I mentioned earlier, it's also your responsibility to think about the care and health of your own animals. So don't be afraid to take your own disinfectant with you to shows. Um, if you're uncomfortable with the, the sanitization of the surface that you're gonna place your rabbit on, you know, take a, a Clorox wipe or uh, you know, some other form of sanitizer and wipe off that surface before you put your animal down on it. Another thing that I've also seen some shows recommending is to think about taking your own carpet square with you when you go to a show or an exhibition, something that only your animals had contact with, um, and place that carpet square down on the shared surface before you put your animal on it. And that's just one additional barrier that you can create between your animals and everybody else. Um, we've talked about hand sanitization and hand washing. I remind you to sanitize your hands frequently, especially after you have contact with shared equipment or surfaces. So, so think about places like restrooms, gates, and concession stands where everybody else has been. Make sure that you sanitize your hands or, or wash your hands before you come back and handle your own equipment or your rabbits. Make sure that you um, arrive at wearing clean clothing. And this seems kind of an odd statement to make, but remember what we talked about earlier, that the virus is, survival, is capable of surviving for 105 days in a dried state. So I'd encourage each and every one of you, after you load your rabbits into, into the vehicle to go to the show, after you load up all of your equipment, to make a quick clothes change and make sure that the clothes that you're wearing into the show um, are clean and have been recently laundered so that you know that you're not tracking in anything into the show. And make sure and sanitize your footwear both before entering the show facility and before going home. Um, and I'd also encourage you to think about it every time you leave the building. Um, you know, so if you choose to leave for lunch and um, go out to your car and, and want to drive away, make sure and sanitize your, your, your shoes before you get into your vehicle. This is a really hardy virus and it can survive a lot of things, um, but we know that we can neutralize the, vi the virus and deactivate it by using um, frequent disinfection. I wanna move on to talking about um, making additions to your colony or to your rabbitry. Um, and I would encourage you to consider the source of a rabbit whenever you make a purchase or an addition to your colony. If that animal's coming from an state or if the breeder that you're purchasing the animals from has also been purchasing animals from an affected state, you might consider waiting to make that purchase or to make that addition until a vaccination is available. Um, 
you know, we certainly can't tell you not to purchase that animal if if you, you know, really want it for genetic diversity or if, if you really need to get it out of a situation. You know, we, we can't discourage you from doing that, but just consider where that animal is coming from. Um, and if you can hold off on, on making the purchase, you know, you might do so until we have a vaccine. The other thing I will suggest too, is if it's coming from an affected area, you might inquire about the vaccine status of the animal because it is available in a lot of those states and it may have been vaccinated before you purchase the animal. Ultimately, it's our responsibility as owners and as caretakers of these animals to make sure that we don't bring diseases home. Um, make sure that you take simple steps every single day to keep these germs away from your rabbits. Um, and, and like I've said before, you know, we're all in the mindset of thinking about personal biosecurity and hand sanitization right now because of COVID-19. So make sure and carry the steps that you're using to protect yourself and your family over to your rabbits. Um, they all apply. So just think about those things when you're, when you're taking care of your animals and think about ways that you can reduce the spread of virus and introduction of virus to your own facilities. So I wanna start um, talking about biosecurity and quarantine and I'll start by defining biosecurity. Biosecurity is the methods that are used to stop a disease or infection from spreading from one person, animal or place to another. And again, like I just said, these are all the things that we're currently doing for COVID-19. It just applies to your animals and, and maybe just a, a few differences in the products that we're using or things like that. This biosecurity will not only prevent foreign animal diseases from being transmitted and spread, but it also protects us against the everyday domestic diseases that we think about with our rabbits, as well as parasites. So biosecurity is always a good practice um, to adopt when you're taking care of your animals. Quarantine is a strict isolation that's imposed on an animal to prevent the spread of disease. I'm gonna start by talking just a little bit about quarantine. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, and this is a different quarantine than we addressed earlier, where we were talking about uh, you know, how long we are gonna restrict the movement of an animal off of a property if there's a positive diagnosis. What I mean in this sense is to make sure that any new additions that you make to your to your colony or to your 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 group of animals or any animals that are returning to your facility for any reason this may be animals that left to go to exhibition or that went to a breeding facility or something like that any animal that is being added or reintroduced to your colony should be quarantined for a minimum of 30 days now if you remember we talked about earlier that um, this virus is able to be shed for up to two months post exposure to the, to the infection. So for RHGV2 and, and prevention of, of this disease, I would honestly consider a minimum of 60 days quarantine whenever you're bringing animals back into the, into the facility or whenever you're adding new additions to the facility. The quarantine area should be a separate physical location. And we talk about this a lot with some of our other species, um, but it applies evenly across all of the different species. A lot of times we'll get people say, you know, if I put one hutch between my animal and the new addition, um, or if I put one kennel between, you know, this animal and a new addition, is that enough? And my answer to you would be no, it's, it's probably not enough. Um, you know, this is a hardy virus. This is a virus that we know can be spread very, very easily, um, even by flies or by mice. Um, so we really need an absolute physical separation between quarantined animals and the rest of your, your colony. Quarantined animals um, not have contact with any other animals, um, including rabbits, wild rabbits, rodents, dogs, cats, raccoons, anything. They need to be in, a, in an isolated area where we can monitor them for signs of illness and make sure that they don't exhibit any clinical signs of illness during the time that they're there. So things I would be thinking about for a quarantine room would be, you know, if you keep your, your rabbits inside your house, um, keep your quarantine rabbits maybe in the garage if, it's, if the temperature is appropriate in that area. If you have a barn or a facility where you keep your rabbits, have a separate room in that facility where you keep your quarantine animals. The better you, you set up your quarantine, um, the, 
the more confident you're going to be in your ability to, to protect the animals that you already have. Um, so I can't stress that enough. Just think about it. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to your veterinarian or to reach out to us here at the Board of Animal Health to talk a little bit more about that. Quarantine animals should have their own equipment and supplies. Um, so just like at a show, you need to make sure that, that everything that you will need to care for the animals in your quarantine facility is there and doesn't leave that, that room as long as the animals are in that location. Um, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be moving a, a feed scoop in and out of quarantine and then feeding other animals because it really defeats the purpose. Um, if it can pick up a viral pathogen when it goes in that room and you don't clean and sanitize that equipment before it leaves the room, you're exposing all of your other rabbits to that same pathogen. Make sure that you sanitize your hands or wear gloves before caring for rabbits in your quarantine area and make sure that you wash and sanitize your hands before you leave. You wanna always care for the rabbits in, in your quarantine period last. So when you're doing your chores and when you're, you're taking care of your animals, you wanna make sure that you take care of all of the animals in your colony first, and then right before you're finished, go into the quarantine area. Um, you know the health status of, of the animals that are already existing in your colony. What we're doing with this quarantine is making sure that we learn about the health status of the animals in quarantine prior to putting them into the, the rest of, you know, in with the rest of the animals and exposing them to something that we're not aware of. You should always think about having specific clothing and shoes that are designated only for your quarantine area. Um, so a lot of times what we'll recommend is that someone have a smock or a pair of coveralls that they only wear when they're going in the quarantine area and that they leave in that area when they exit. Um, so you don't need to make a complete clothes change before you go in and out of your quarantine area, but certainly having something that will protect your clothing and keep secretions and excretions off of your clothing um, is, is certainly recommended. Um, at the Board of Animal Health, a lot of times what we'll do when we show up at a farm is, is we'll put on a clean, brand new pair of coveralls um, every single time that we go onto a farm. We also have disposable shoes um, or disposable shoe covers that we wear so that, that we know that we're not tracking something onto your farm and you know the same thing. And I would encourage you to adopt that for your quarantine area. Obviously, you wanna make sure that you're laundering those um, smocks or, or coveralls on a regular basis um, and make sure that you disinfect the, the shoes or the shoe covers if they're not disposable. Make sure that you clean and sanitize all cages and equipment after the rabbits are moved out of this area so that it's ready for the next time to bring animals back home or you want to add to your colony. So moving on to cleaning and disinfection, um, I want to encourage you to, can, to get into the habit of regularly removing manure from this facility. Uh, we talked about the survivability of the virus earlier and um, if we don't remove this manure, we could potentially be harboring parasites or, or viral pathogens or other pathogens um, so by, by getting that manure out on a regular basis and properly disposing of it, we're reducing the amount of, of pathogens that our rabbits are exposed to. We absolutely have to make sure that we remove all organic material before we clean and before we disinfect. Um, so the process that I would recommend is to, to get in there, make sure that you get all of the bedding out, the hair that's stuck to the, the wire of your hutches, any hay, feces, or urine that may be in there before you, you clean and disinfect. Because quite honestly, it's impossible to disinfect feces and have that you've neutralized any virus or pathogen that's in there. It just can't be done. So you need to make sure and clean those materials out. Um, and then go ahead and scrub the, scrub the cages, um, scrub the surfaces with, with soap and water, um, and allow them to dry. And then make sure that you use an approved disinfectant for this pathogen. So the, the disinfectants we know are effective against RHGV2 include uh, household bleach at a one to 10 dilution. And, and essentially what this would mean is one cup of bleach for a gallon of water um, to create your disinfectant solution. There are also several commercially available products that are, are proven to be effective against RHGV2, one stroke Environ, Vircon S, or there are several products that are accelerated hydrogen peroxide products, and those would be Prevail, Rescue, which used to be called Excel or Peroxigard, and those are all disinfectants that we know are effective. So in closing up our cleaning and disinfection, make sure that you use an approved disinfectant. 
Make sure you clean and remove all organic material and debris and then disinfect all items in your rabbitry. Make sure you allow appropriate contact time for the disinfectant to work. And so what I mean by this is um, the just having a moment of contact between this disinfectant and the virus is not enough to neutralize the virus, the virus or the pathogen. We need to make sure that we follow the label directions and provide an adequate contact time for that pathogen to be neutralized or deactivated. So for this particular virus and, and most of the um, products that I mentioned on the previous slide, the amount of contact time is 10 minutes. So what you wanna do is you wanna clean a surface, apply the disinfectant and allow it to sit for a period of at least 10 minutes and then rinse that surface off very, very well. Um, you do this to avoid corrosion of the materials of the surface, as well as to reduce contact um, with your rabbits at a later date. So make sure that you um, sanitize all of your equipment and cages before you return from a show so that you make sure you're not bringing something home from the show. Make sure that you use materials or cages that can be effectively disinfected. And I think someone talked about this previously. Um, back in 2005, when we had veterinarians go out to the farm that was infected with RHTV1, we found that a lot of the materials that they were using for their hutches or for the buildings where the anim animals were being housed was wood. And unfortunately, wood is a porous material and we aren't able to um, disinfect it with certainty to know that we're neutralizing the virus. Um, so unfortunately, in order for us to, to be able to reassure that owner that we had effectively eliminated the virus from that property, we had to burn um, a lot of the wooden hutches and things like that, or he, you know, he chose to burn the, those cages. And so I would encourage you to consider, um, you know, making sure that you have non-porous materials and cages that can be effectively disinfected um, you know, things like stainless steel or water or, or plastic, things that we know um, can be effectively cleaned and disinfected. And make sure that you clean and disinfect your feeding and your watering equipment on a regular basis. Um, if you have an automatic watering system, I would contact the manufacturer and see if, if it is okay to run a disinfectant through that system um, periodically. And then obviously, if you choose to do that, make sure that you thoroughly rinse that system out before you begin to water your rabbits again. Um, but just make sure you're, you're, you're cleaning and disinfecting things on a regular basis. I wanna kind of wrap things up today by talking about biosecurity techniques that you can use at home to try to prevent the spread of infection into your colony. Um, and I've broken it down into a couple different um, areas. Um, so we'll start with housing. We know that rabbits that live outdoors or exercise outdoors are at a higher risk of contracting diseases, especially RHDV2, since wild rabbits can be a source of infection for our domestic rabbits and vice versa. So we encourage you to consider housing all rabbits indoors if possible. And I don't mean that they have to live in your home. Um, you know, certainly that's okay if that's what you choose, but think about having them in, a, in an indoor environment, whether that's a, a wooden shed or a garage or a pole barn. Um, we know that rabbits that are indoors are, are certainly at a lower risk for contracting diseases. If your rabbits are housed outdoors, consider um, put, having a double fence so that you can avoid contact with wildlife. You know, so things like scavengers, like coyotes or raccoons, uh, dogs, cats, rodents, all of those things. Prevent contact with wild rabbits, most certainly. And then consider housing rabbits in hutches or cages that are up off the ground to reduce the ex potential exposure to wild rabbits and, and um, other species that can make mechanically move the virus around. When we talk about husbands, this may sound kind of weird, but I've seen on a lot of different resources, um, including the, the House Rabbit Society, that you consider making your indoor areas a shoe-free zone. Um, and so, they are encouraging you to keep both an indoor pair of shoes and an outdoor pair of shoes um, and don't cross contaminate. We know that, that our shoes can serve as mechanical vectors for this disease. So by not wearing shoes from outside into the facilities where we, we house our rabbits, we're just taking one additional step to reduce the spread of infection if at all possible. Make sure that you wash your hands um, and sanitize before and after handling rabbits. 
and between groups of rabbits in your facility. Um, don't allow visitors who also own or care for rabbits into your facility. If you do need to allow them to come in, try to minimize their handling of your rabbits um, and also make sure to provide proper PPE, um, you know, uh, some sort of a smock and shoe covers um, or sanitize their, their footwear before they come into your facility. Um, try to avoid handling other people's rabbits that aren't owned by you. And if you do have any sick rabbits in your colony, make sure that you handle those rabbits last so that you avoid spreading any pathogens the remainder of the animals in your colony. Make sure and quarantine all of your new rabbits or re rabbits returning to the colony. Make sure that you have adequate uh, measures in place to control disease vectors. Remember that non-susceptible animals and insects can move the virus around on their feet or their body. And beware of scavengers and their spread infection in a viable infectious form in their fecal material. Talk about feeding considerations. Um, do not allow your rabbits to graze on the ground. And I know that this is, uh, you know, this is a way that we can get rabbits outside and get them some sunshine and, and you know, enjoy the day with them. But think about the fact that wild rabbits, if they become infected, have the ability to contaminate the grass, you know, where you may be placing your animal to graze. Um, so if you can avoid this habit right now, I would certainly recommend not allowing rabbits to graze on the ground. Don't collect outdoor forage to feed your rabbits and make sure that you're sourcing hay from unaffected areas. And, you know, not a big deal right now because we're pretty far removed from the southwestern states where the, the wild rabbits are, are currently located. Um, but if we see movement of this infection towards Indiana, make sure that you start thinking about where you're getting your hay from and whether or not it may have been contaminated. I mentioned this previously, but make sure that you establish a, a relationship with a veterinarian that you know and trust. Make sure you're monitoring your animals for signs of illness each and every day. And if something seems wrong, if they seem a little bit off, talk to your veterinarian and see about getting them in, potentially having some diagnostics done. Um, we receive calls from veterinarians all the time asking us to, to um, you know, help them think through cases. And so, you know, being aware of the health status of your animals and checking that every day is a good, is a good practice to start doing. Um, if you establish a working relationship with a veterinarian now, they can assist you when your rabbits are showing signs of illness. They can work with you to rever review your biosecurity practices. And they can also help get the vaccination for you when it becomes available later this year, hopefully. own rabbits and you're out and about and you see multiple dead wild rabbits, do not touch them. And I know this kind of goes against what we all think. Um, I think human nature is if you are concerned about something to get rid of it immediately. But if you own rabbits, um, I would encourage you not to touch them. Make a note of the location and then contact the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, the Fish and Wildlife Office at 812 334-1137. And you don't need to write the, down these phone numbers right now. Um, I have a slide at the very end that's going to have all of the contact information on it. But um, once you contact the DNR, they're going to let you know whether the, this particular dead rabbit or group of dead rabbits is a concern for them. And they'll give you instructions at that point, either how to collect that rabbit safely or how to, um, to, to get someone out to that location to collect it on your behalf. Remember that any sudden death in, a, in an owned rabbit is suspicious and you should report that to your veterinarian ASAP. Um, and you know, feel free to contact our agency if you have concerns about RHDB2 or if you're worried that one of your animals is affected. Our number is 317-544-2400 or you can certainly email us at animalhealth@boa.in.gov. Finish up. Um, you know, I, I hope none of you ever have to face this, but if you do have dead rabbits in your colony, I want to make sure that everybody's aware of how to handle them safely to avoid exposure to your other animals. Make sure that you wear disposable gloves whenever you're handling a deceased rabbit. You want to double bag the carcass in plastic trash bags, making sure to tie the trash bag, uh, both the first trash bag and then the second trash bag. Disinfect the outside of the bag with either a 10% bleach solution, Vercon S, or one of the other approved disinfectants. Uh, 
Um, and then contact the appropriate agency, whether that be the DNR or our office or your veterinarian to determine what the next steps are to get, you know, to get samples submitted. If you can't get that animal to a veterinarian right away for sampling, it's okay to go ahead and refrigerate that animal. Um, if you don't feel good about putting the animal in a refrigerator or if you don't have access to a refrigerator, um, you can put that animal in a cooler with a bag of ice. We just want to make sure that these these animals aren't frozen or these carcasses aren't frozen because it can affect the quality of our diagnostics um, and delay us getting a, a result for you. Um, so just make sure and keep the, the carcass cool until we can get diagnostic samples collected and make sure and wash your hands and use hand, hand sanitizer when you're finished before you go back and, and handle any of your own equipment. Um, we will start answering some of the questions that we've we've gotten. Um, please feel free to go ahead and put questions in the text box. Um, one of the questions we have is um, any other species known to harbor or contract RHDV2? Um, and the answer is no. At this point, the only species that we're aware of that are able to, to um, become infected with the virus is rabbits, either wild or domestic. Um, just remember that other species can mechanically move the virus around. Um, so the first question, these are about food and water. The first question, do you recommend a type of water, tap versus bottled? And at this point, while we don't currently have the infection in Indiana, um, I don't have a recommended type of water. I do know that um, there is information to suggest that the virus is able to contaminate um, shallow surface water. So in the affected states, they are recommending that people not use well water to, to provide water for their rabbits. They're suggesting that people either use city water that's been treated or bottled water. Um, so the answer is right now in Indiana, I don't think there's necessarily a difference, um, but definitely, um, you know, if we if we find that we have it in Indiana, you would certainly want to stay away from uh, well water. This says, is there a way to clean fresh garden vegetables to be safe for feeding, um, such as kale? Um, recommendation that has been widely distributed is that we avoid fresh garden vegetables in endemic areas. Um, you know, obviously you can wash the product, but I certainly wouldn't recommend um, using a disinfectant or one of the, the recommendations, you know, like bleach or something like that. I, I certainly don't feel like we can advocate using any of those products on food that's going to be then given to the animals. Um, you know, so I would say Provide fresh vegetables from your garden at your own risk. Right now, we don't currently have the disease in Indiana, or we don't know that, you know, that we, we don't have any um, indication that we have the disease in Indiana, but I don't know that there's necessarily a way to effectively um, clean fresh vegetables to be certain that you, you aren't transmitting the virus. Um, risk of using manure or compost. Um, on gardens, since we know that the survival can be 105 days or more. And I think this relates back to, um, you know, the, the disease is not a risk for humans. So by using manure and things like that on vegetables, it's, it's not a public health concern for humans. Um, so I wouldn't discourage you from using it in th that capacity. But if you are um, considering feeding any of those fresh vegetables from your garden, back to your animals, then I certainly wouldn't advocate using um, manure or pellets as a means of, um, as a means of uh, fertilizing that garden. Will Indiana impose a CVI requirement like other states to go to Indiana shows? And at this point in time, um, we are not imposing any regulations. Shows um, are capable of imposing those requirements on their own. Um, so they, um, you know, they could require a health paper with the, um, the thing with health papers is, is that they are, um, they have to be signed within 10 days of an inspection and they're good for 30 days following the inspection by that veterinarian. With the short incubation time of this virus, um, it's hard to really know if, if 
having a CVI requirement is really going to make that much of a difference. Um, you know, shows can certainly make that consideration if they want to, but at this point, um, we haven't considered making that change. Got a couple more questions here. Uh, the first question is, what do you advise for people who work with lab rabbits? What if they have exposure to home or pet rabbits? Um, if you work with lab rabbits and you have rabbits at home, I would certainly recommend that you think about um, changing your clothing when you return home from work, making sure that you launder that clothing um, in, in hot water at least once, if not twice, with a, you know, with, with cleaner um, before you come into contact with your own animals. Uh, think about washing and sanitizing your hands or even showering if you, you know, you want to be completely um, proactive before you handle your own animals. Um, so yes, I would, I would take precautions. I certainly in that situation would make sure that I'm not wearing my footwear that I wear to work um, anywhere near my rabbits. The petting zoos present a risk. Should sanitizing or washing hands be required? Um, if there are rabbits in the petting zoo, then yes, I think they, they have the same risk as any other rabbit um, in contracting the virus and spreading the virus. Um, so, you know, certainly if you go to a petting zoo and you own rabbits, you want to make sure that you are um, sanitizing and working uh, or and washing your hands before and after you handle those animals. Um, and it wouldn't be a bad idea for the caretakers of the animals at those petting zoos to have a requirement for people to wash their hands before handling the animals as well. Um, do whole or frozen purchased rabbits for feeding to carnivores present a risk at zoo settings? Um, and I think the answer to this is, I mean, essentially the whole or frozen rabbits are infected uh, before they're, they're frozen and they're fed to carnivores then certainly from what we know, they are capable of then passing that virus through their GI tract unimpeded and spreading that into the environment. So yeah, I think that they can potentially pose a risk. Question is, oh, two questions, I'm sorry. Um, will there be extra guidance for shelters and pet stores? Um, Yeah, if there's if there's something that we need to communicate to shelters and pet stores, we can certainly we can certainly get that out. Um, and then the last question is, would BOA be involved in the vaccine use once it is available? Um, and that's kind of a, a there's really two answers to that. If we are using the unlicensed product, um, so heaven forbid we become an affected state and we begin to import the unlicensed product from Europe then yes, BOA would be directly involved in um, approving that importation into the state. If we are talking about the licensed vaccine that we're expecting later that this year, um, then there wouldn't necessarily be a requirement for BOA to be involved in the distribution or administration of that vaccine. So I'm sorry that we've run a little bit over. Um, I appreciate everybody for hanging with us. Um, Oh, and I do need to, to mention one last thing. We have our website listed on here, which is www.in.gov BOA. We have information about rabbits. It's currently on the left-hand side under species information. And it's right now it's down under, under other species, um, but that may be moving in the future. If you type rabbits into the search bar, you'll be able to find our website. Um, and we are setting up an email and text notice service. Um, we've, we've put that request into our um, IoT division. And so hopefully either later this week or early next week, when you go onto our Rabbit webpage, a pop-up will, will come up and ask you if you want, to re you want to subscribe to updates from our agency. So if you check back with, with that location and go ahead and subscribe, anytime we have new information, we'll get it directly out to you. Um, so the question was, the question was, um, other states are requiring microchips for identification 
and vaccinated animals? And do we anticipate needing that or requiring that once a vaccine becomes available? The, the current um, requirement um, is because of record keeping requirements um, for use with the unlicensed product. So in order for the states to be able to import that unlicensed product and distribute it, there's a, there's a requirement for them to keep records on who that vaccine is administered to. There's no, require, there's no requirement for an FDA licensed product to require um, microchipping or identification, permanent identification. So I don't anticipate having that same requirement if we are using the licensed product later this year. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, again, I apologize for going over and I apologize for the challenges that we had at the beginning of this presentation. Um, you know, we just, all of us here at the Board of Animal Health, thank you guys for your interest and, and your concern for rabbit health. If you have any questions or if, if you feel that we need to have further dialogue, don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll be happy to talk with you. So thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.